is our guest today, uh, Parimal Pache, professor in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and one of the leading authorities in the world on ancient Indian philosophy and religion. Parimal. Thank you. I wish I could promise an afternoon with as much eloquence as I'm sure you're used to, but sadly, I cannot. So what I'm going to try to do instead is offer you a bit of a picture of what and how Buddhists might have thought about the conduct of life. And if I do it right, I will bore you for a few minutes throughout the course of, the, of, of what I'm going to say. And I hope to end with three or four rather incendiary conclusions, which I hope at least some amongst the group, either Roberto or Cornell, all of you find incendiary, and we can then have a conversation to talk about. What I'm taking as a starting point is some of the readings that you did from the source book, which, as I assume you all know, is a tiny, 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 tiny curated slice of Indian Buddhism. So what I thought I would do is I would introduce the idea of the conduct of life as it was understood and interpreted by one group of Buddhists in India, and suggest that it was given meaning by appealing to what they thought of as a spectrum of felicity, or forms of well-being, that included daily matters, weekly matters, and yearly matters, the things that we all worry about, like food, safety, wealth, health, family, as well as matters of more ultimate concern, for example, nirvana, which tends to be the favored way in which people want to think about Buddhism in India in terms of nirvana or compassion. But I want to suggest we could think about it in terms of this whole spectrum of human felicity. So Buddhist discourse, the idea is about the conduct of life is on this view, discourse about a very wide spectrum of felicity and not just the discourse of nirvana or compassion with which it is all too often identified. The broader notion of the conduct of Buddhist life can, in my view, help us to better understand both the relevance and irrelevance of nirvana to the spectrum of Buddhist felicity more generally and perhaps more importantly, better appreciate the South Asian Buddhist context for comparative purposes as we think about how we ought to live our lives and approach normative ethics more specifically, which I think is one of the issues you've been talking about in, this, in the class. So I want to pursue some of this by focusing on what I'm calling the syntax of nirvana. And you can think of nirvana as any top shelf Buddhist concept that you think ought to be the principal way in which we think about Buddhism in India. For some, it's nirvana. For many, it's compassion. I mean, you can put emptiness. Whatever you think is most important to begin with. I'm going to call it the syntax of nirvana in Buddhist India. And I'll conclude again with these four, I hope, incendiary conclusions that, which will do, if I do it right, will lead to some useful conversation. So first, a bit of just history and background. You read, many, you read a number of samples from the so-called Pali canon. And many think that the Pali canon represents the oldest recording of the words and teachings of the Buddha. And they have different ideas about the historicity of the canon. So just might be worth starting with what the canon is, and it's only 10 seconds. Look, Pali as a language, the oldest examples we have are probably from the 5th or 6th century CE. The Pali canon in the version that we have is centuries older. So according to traditional accounts, even according to traditional accounts and traditional histories, the Pali Canon wasn't put to writing until 450 years after the death of the Buddha. So anyone who suggests that the Pali Canon is the word of the Buddha or somehow unproblematically represents what the Buddha actually taught, I mean, that idea is kind of a fantasy, right? If the oldest examples of the language we have are the 5th century CE, the, the tradition itself says the first time it was written down was 450 years after the death of the Buddha. And the current version of the Pali Canon is centuries later. No one should take it as a kind of documentary account of what the Buddha taught or thought. So what do we do? We have this Pali corpus, this Pali Canon. How do we learn from it? And what can we say about Buddhism on the basis of it? So I want you to think of an idea called the Pali Imaginaire, which comes from the work of a man named Steve Collins. So the Pali Imaginaire is a kind of mental universe that was created by and within Pali texts that for the most part constitute this Pali canon. We could also imagine a parallel kind of Mahayana Imaginaire. You also read Mahayana texts, right? So this world that was created by and within the Pali Imaginaire remained 
surprisingly stable in content throughout the traditional period and moved as a kind of whole, right? You see all the books are on a shelf, right? It moved as a whole in various times and places in the pre-modern world and also, of course, in the modern world. And this imaginaire, it's best to think of it as a kind of ideological product of traditional Buddhism or mainstream Buddhism, a period in Buddhist history in which Pali was a living yet still learned language, that is from the time of Ashoka maybe, third century BCE, until the modern period, sometime in the beginning of the 19th century. Why does this matter? Because if you don't know who composed or when something was composed, you can't situate it in a historical context in the same way you can with an authored work that has a good date. And we're talking centuries time span. So let's take the text as it is and think of a Pali imaginaire. So much of what I'm gonna say is about the Pali imaginaire. Does that make sense? All right. So there is what's in this imaginaire that's relevant for the conduct of life. The idea is this. There is in this imaginaire a spectrum of felicities or forms of well-being that range from those that are local, sort of imaginatively efficient, and grounded in very particular concerns, as well as those that are translocal, universal, and associated with ultimate concerns. So if we are able to understand, or if we are to understand the conduct of life broadly, and in my view properly, as construed in these texts, it's on the base of this spectrum of felicities that we have to focus our attention. So then we can ask, fine, there's this polyimaginaire, and there's a spectrum of felicities that deals with the mundane and also goes all into high-end things like nirvana. What's it like? What's it like to live a good life or to conduct life in the polyimaginaire? And the first thing to realize is it really depends on where you live and on who you are, sort of in which of the cosmological realms in Buddhist cosmology you find yourself. It's not the same. Just a brief account of the cosmology. So there are different kinds of worlds or realms. There's something called the Brahma worlds. There's the Deva worlds. And then there's human worlds as well as subhuman worlds. What's most important for our purposes is to focus on how these variously and hierarchically structured worlds are imagined, right? And, how they, and what constitutes well-being in each of them. And what, if anything, makes them specifically Buddhist, right? So we have a cosmology in which there are many different kinds of worlds. If you want to try to understand how Buddhists in pre-modern India thought about the conduct of life and what it meant to live well, the first thing we realize is, oh, well, we have to ask, live well in which world? And there are different pictures of what the good life is in these different worlds and how we ought to conduct ourselves. We are, of course, most interested in the human world. But to understand what the human world means, we have to have it in the context of the other worlds. So five minutes on the worlds and what we can learn about the human world from this particularly Buddhist cosmological scheme. So first, there's earth and below. That is the human worlds and the worlds of beings like nagas and it's often translated as hungry ghosts. One is called, this is the boring part of the details. I hope the other part wasn't, you thought, we didn't think the other part was the boring part. This is the boring no, part. No, no, no. I'm no. promising you this is the boring part. Not boring so at all. So the first, not at all. the first of these human were earth and below is called Uttarakuru. And it's characterized, let's think of this. This is, this, is, this is one of the earth and below worlds. Think about it carefully. It's Uttarakuru. It's characterized by its wish fulfilling tree. The people here far surpass other humans and gods in their unselfishness and lack of possessiveness and covetousness. They're naturally virtuous, and their world is one of abundance, especially of food and beauty. Does this sound like our world? No. Our world, but this is still in the, in the earth realm. This is close to our world, but not our world. Our world is a place called Jambudvipa, and it's the southernmost of the four continents that make up the human world. Our continent, which is our world, is, constitu is one in which the otherwise constant struggle for food and comfort can be suspended, but only occasionally. And where happiness and pleasure can be experienced, but only intermittently. There's a heavenly set of worlds. There's a deva world. And here, in the deva world, there are sensual pleasures, gorgeous abodes, sensuous though not erotic pleasure, beauty, heavenly music, good stuff. Now, for each of these worlds that I've described, Buddhist literature is full of narratives of what it's like to live in these worlds. They're fleshed out in great detail. And with these stories, you can really imagine what it would be like to be an inhabitant of the various worlds. 
and what constitutes well-being or the conduct of life in each. Obviously, our world is the human world, and that's also represented, but we understand it in contrast to the others. There's another set of worlds called the Brahma worlds. In case you're interested, there's 20 of them. And they're each indexed to a kind of, to a level of meditation, which is itself associated with a kind of felicity that ranges from a feeling of rapture and happiness that pervades the body. The image uses a rock cave filled with water to happiness of the mind without the body, to a state of equanimity, mindfulness, and purity. Like someone sitting in clean, the images of someone sitting in a clean white robe, which is touching every part of one's body. These experiences or states are all intense, internal, and for the most part, private. Remember, this is not our world. This is a world, but not ours. But it tends to be the world in which people most associate with Buddhism. What's interesting is that for this world, there are very few, if any, narratives. These worlds are, for the most part, internal, mental, and in an important sense, private. OK, fine. Polyimaginaire, worlds, our world, more or less ideal world relative to ours. What about nirvana? So nirvana, is, I guess you should know from the readings you did, is outside of the spatiotemporal location, the conditioned world of rebirth. As is well known, there are in the Pali imaginary are two kinds of nirvana. There's nirvana in life, which we sometimes think is an enlightenment. So this is what an arhant experiences, what is pleasant and unpleasant, enjoyable and painful. And in such a person, there's usually a destruction of passion, hatred, and delusion. And there's also the kind of nirvana that you get upon, not you, but one gets upon death. And it's a state in which all feelings are said to go cold. All right? So who cares? The underlying logic is something like this. This is, again, something that Steve Collins really articulates well. If the universe is the kind of place which can contain such happinesses, the universe means all the cosmological realms. If it is a place that can contain wish-fulfilling trees, if it's a place where people can be maximally generous, if it's a place where you can have this kind of peace, even if not for me, in the immediate future or even medium term future, then maybe our world is a place that we can live in meaningfully. The idea is that if we have this cosmology with all of these possibilities, even though those possibilities aren't realities for me, and even though they won't be realities for me in the medium term or long term, by the way, in Buddhist cosmology, you spend eons in each of them. It's not like you're in one world Monday, and then Tuesday you get to move to the wish fulfilling tree world. You're in these <laughs> worlds for eons. So these worlds are ones that are present in the cosmology, but aren't readily available to me. But even though that's the case, the fact that they're there, the fact they're part of my universe, seems to provide an idea that the world in which I live is one in which I can also live meaningfully. Think about whether you think that's a good idea. And also, we should think of the Buddhist felicities we haven't gone in detail. They're not a random collection of just things. They're kind of structured. And what gives them structure is by this idea of nirvana. So the point about nirvana as a syntactic closure, and then I'll get to some of my conclusions, incendiary and otherwise. So the point I want to make about nirvana, and I said you could substitute your favorite Buddhist concept for it, the one you think that is most important, is that nirvana functions as a kind of syntactic closure. What does that mean? It means that nirvana is the end, like a period or a punctuation mark in a sentence. And as such, it defines the sentence. I can have a sentence, I put an exclamation point, or a period, or a question mark. In a way, it, you see what I mean? it kind of constitutes the whole sentence. You have to wait till you get to the, you have to, it's the end that defines what kind of a sentence it is. So nirvana is the kind of end. It's the punctuation mark that makes this spectrum of felicities a specifically Buddhist spectrum of felicities. The words might be the same in the sentence. But there's nirvana at the end, which makes it a Buddhist sentence. There might be something else at the end, which makes it a Hindu sentence or a Christian sentence. In principle, the words could be the same. But we're interested in whether they're different or not, and why, and how we figure that out. But nirvana provides a kind of syntactic closure. So this picture undermines two widely held views. The first view is that nirvana, or any of your favorite concepts like that, is central to Buddhist, that, that is central to Buddhist doctrine, is central to the conduct of life. So we have a punctuation mark. On the one hand, it's present. It defines the sentence. But on the other hand, how central is it? 
Does it pervade every other word? Does it define every other word? Does it give every other word meaning? Maybe it's not as central as we think. The second view that it undermines is that nirvana is not central to almost all Buddhist practice. Because on the other hand, so people want to say nirvana is everything. You have to think of everything Buddhists do in terms of nirvana. OK, or your favorite high-end concept. In a way, that's right. It marks syntactic closure, defines a sentence. But on the other hand, you know, the punctuation mark doesn't define every word in the sentence. It doesn't give it meaning or give it radically different meaning. The other view is that, well, you know, nirvana isn't really important at all, as you've just shown. The punctuation doesn't really matter. And the point is it does matter because it defines the sentence. The question is, what do we do with this? How do we make sense of it? Here's where the incendiary conclusions come in. And you may or may not see them as related. The first point was simply that when we think about the conduct of life, in pre-modern India and in Buddhism or any kind of pre-modern tradition, in, in religious tradition in particular, we have to remember that it's not about, in the way that we think, these high-end concepts like nirvana or moksha. It's not that they're not about it, but they're not about it because it's a whole spectrum of felicities, right? It's the whole range from the daily to the rare that actually define the Buddhist sentence and the Buddhist conduct of life. So we need to ask about, what do you do when your child is sick? What do you do if your neighbor is hungry? What do you do if you're mad at somebody? These are critical to the conduct of a good Buddhist life or a good Hindu life or a good life defined by a punctuation mark in this way. We can ask what role the type of punctuation plays in how we ought to conduct ourselves in the life of this sentence. But that's what we need to think about. The picture needs to be like this. I don't think it needs to be one where you think about compassion this, or emptiness this, or nirvana that. OK, my incendiary conclusions. First, if we take all the books of Indian philosophy, every single one ever written, that classical Indian philosophers thought of as philosophical, you will, without any trouble at all, be able to find works of metaphysics, epistemology, philosophy of language, philosophy of mind, semantics, aesthetics. You will not find, I challenge you, you will not find a single, single example of a work of specifically philosophical ethics or philosophical political science. What does that mean? That means that the people who wrote works of metaphysics and epistemology and philosophy of language did not write <coughs> works of ethics or of political theory. That does not mean that people in pre-modern <laughs> India were not interested in what we would call the conduct of life, or we even call ethics, or we even call politics. What it does mean is they did not write it and did not think that you can pursue those matters in the same way they thought you could pursue matters of metaphysics, epistemology, philosophy of language. Why? This is the best I can do. I think they thought that writing about ethics and political theory in the same way you wrote about the other things just wouldn't work. What does that mean? Suppose you really want to teach someone to be good or, how to, or teach someone about how to conduct life. Or you want to teach a king or a president how to be a good one. It's not clear that reading works of analytic philosophy would be necessarily helpful. There might be other things that one needs. And those are the kinds of texts that are produced. So conclusion one, incendiary conclusion one. I challenge you to find me a single example of a work of philosophical ethics or philosophical political theory written in classical Sanskrit. Even one example disproves my, well, doesn't disprove, but complicates my picture. <laughs> the issue is what is there instead, right? What is there instead? Second, that religion and ethics in pre-modern India and Buddhism don't go together. What does that mean? I want you to consider the idea that success on the path, the path divine by your favorite high-end concept, and living a good life are not as tightly tied as we might think or want them to be. So the question is, do you really have to lead a good life or conduct oneself in a good way to be successful religiously, to make progress on the Hindu or Buddhist path? My claim is the answer will surprise you. Suppose you think, people tend to think of religion as being related to metaphysics. We can ask, does having a metaphysics of self or no self make any difference? how you're supposed to live well, or to how people in pre-modern India thought about living well. 
we can have the spectrum of felicities, for example. Does whether you're do you have a metaphysics thumbs up to self or thumbs down to self have any bearing on the spectrum of felicities and how you ought to pursue them? Does doctrine matter at all for the conduct of life? It certainly matters for other reasons, but does it matter for the conduct of life? If you look at other kinds of literature from pre-modern India, think of narratives or story literature. Bad people get all kinds of things from the gods. Okay, what's the question? How is religion and the conduct of life connected or not connected in Buddhist India? My second incendiary conclusion, they're not connected. Third, the picture that we have of the Buddhist imaginaire is not what we are programmed to expect. Not everything is all right in the human world, as you saw from even my brief description. Right? It's a world where hunger may be gone, but only for a short time, where you may experience pleasure, but it's intermittent. Not everything is all right. And even a religious life and the conduct of a good life cannot make it so. Life is precarious and fragile, and large sociopolitical struggles can bring about an end to the world as we know it. Life is suffering, but suffering need not be bad or feel bad. It is like life, real, but impermanent. Third conclusion, the picture we have of what it means to succeed in a Buddhist life or in a pre-modern Indian life is not the right picture. Life is real, impermanent, and not always good. Last. The last is less of a conclusion and more of why we ought to bother with pre-modern India at all. What is it, how do we go about thinking about what early modern Buddhism has to offer? And it's about the possibility of alternatives. I'll give you an example. So uh, South Asian kids of a certain age, well, they're not kids, old people like me, my age, uh, don't say thank you to their parents. It's not a translation problem. If I was speaking to my parents in Marathi, we could have a calc for translation. I wouldn't use it. Speaking to them in English, I never used it. Actually, once I tried, and they got mad at me. It's not because Indian kids like me, or old people like me, don't value their parents, or don't care about them, or don't appreciate it. So why don't we say thank you, even when we speak to them in English? Why are our relationships in English absent of thank you? I don't know. One way to think about it is maybe thank you is transactional. <coughs> say thank you, say you're welcome, we're done. South Asian families aren't like that. No good deed is ever paid. There are patterns of obligation and reciprocity and hospitality that never, <coughs> ever, ever end. Mm. <laughs> Why does this matter? It means that, it suggests that there's an alternative possibility for the way in which one can inhabit a family that might be different, fundamentally different, might feel different, might be different, might have different accounts, competing accounts. Now, what I want to suggest is that thank you isn't the only such concept. That maybe other concepts are like thank you. Maybe concepts that we hold very dear, like rights, or justice, or happiness. Now, just like thank you, it's not that South Asian kids are rude. Well, some are. Or, or have disrespect. But there's an alternative set of values. Trying to figure out what they are might be what we can really get from pre-modern India, even if some of those alternatives are destructive. They're going to be constructive ones and destructive ones. Let's figure out what they are. Get rid of the constructive, I mean, get rid of the destructive ones and keep the constructive ones and be prepared that the constructive ones might not match up. Just like I hope some of what I said about the poly imaginaire doesn't match up. So my thoughts for today were to try to frame a little bit about what you read and, and make it a little less familiar and comfortable by trying to tell you about the poly imaginaire and what it meant or how how Pali, the Pali Imaginaire and Buddhists who produced that world might think about the conduct of life in terms of a spectrum of human felicities, what role things like nirvana and maybe other high-end metaphysical concepts do and don't play in both a positive way in defining the sentence and also maybe a less significant way. I also then try to suggest at the end 
what thinking about things in this way might do for us, what it challenges. And I suggest that it challenges four things. It challenges the way we think about the need for ethics as a subdiscipline of philosophy or political theory. I suggest that it challenges the way we want to think or expect religion and ethics to be tied together. I suggest that it challenges the picture that we want or that many people want or think there is for what success in a Buddhist life is. And I suggested that it's because of all these challenges that we still have something to learn from places like pre-modern India and from the Pali imaginary. That's what I got. Harry Mal, let me, let me draw you out a little further. Wonderful, <coughs> wonderful, wonderful. Uh, and uh, press you on the, on the contrast of your view, your view of ancient Indian philosophy and Buddhism to what has been a conventional contrast, a conventional understanding, especially in the West. And it is an understanding expressed, for example, by Schopenhauer, who we study next week, in his allusions to ancient Indian philosophy and religion. So this, this conventional view has two large parts. So one part is it, it claims that a particular approach to the conduct of life is rooted in a metaphysical representation of ultimate reality. It is a representation that we sometimes call speculative monism. The really real is ultimately one and timeless, and all the distinctions and changes that appear in the world are either unreal or less real. The ultimately real is, is outside of time and unitary. Uh, and uh, I understand that you have uh, attack this idea, that is, suggesting that a large part of ancient Indian philosophy and religion, including Buddhism, uh, does not rely on this metaphysical view, or indeed on any metaphysical view. So that's one way in which your account diverges from this conventional uh, view. But there's a second way, which is of special interest to us. So in the conventional view, there is a central ethical vision conveyed in this ancient Indian tradition and uh, elaborated by Buddhism. Uh, in that central vision, we are commanded, we are advised to overcome the will, to overcome craving, desire, insatiability. The connection to the metaphysical view is that so long as we take seriously the divisions and changes of the will, our, our illusions, our misunderstanding of ultimate reality helps entangle us in these coils of suffering. So we, should, we should overcome the will. And we should overcome the will in a particular direction. And the direction is to achieve an ethic uh, the hallmarks of which are serenity and benevolence. We come into the possession of ourselves. We cease to suffer by conquering the will. And then we recognize our fundamental oneness with all other selves and indeed all other creatures. Uh, and then we achieve liberation. Now, uh, so the second question is whether in attacking the first element of the conventional account, you also mean to be attacking the second element, which is the centrality of this particular ethical vision. And if you are attacking it, is, is it because you're saying there's another central ethical vision? Or is, is it because you're saying there's no unifying ethical vision whatsoever? So I think this picture, which you characterized through Schopenhauer, shows why Schopenhauer is such a clever man. In the sense, he's able to create a, a compelling picture based on what he had access to. And as you said, I think the picture is wrong in many levels. For the, the key problem is the word rooted. The idea was that the ethical vision is rooted 
in a certain metaphysics or the certain metaphysical picture is connected or suggests or makes possible a certain kind of ethical picture. So my view is that, that metaphysics and ethics are not rooted or connected like that in Buddhist India or pre-modern India in general. That's not to say there isn't a metaphysics. So the metaphysics that you described of, a, of monism is present in large parts of the Indian philosophical tradition. There's many good idealists, monists, solipsists, they're a very powerful tradition. There's also an equally powerful tradition that doesn't accept any of those things. So there is, of course, there is absolutely a metaphysics. My claim is it's not rooted or connected to the ethics, and I'll get to that in a second. What that means is you could have two people who adopt two incompatible metaphysical systems in pre-modern India, and in principle they could share the same ethical, same ethical picture, I'll say. Roberto used the word vision, and he characterized the ethical vision as one in which right, a kind of ego or craving is supposed to be quieted, and in quieting it, we attain a certain kind of serenity. Right? And that was supposed to then match up in a consistent way with the metaphysical picture. So it seems right that one thing that we see in a lot of pre-modern South Asian literature is this concern with craving and clinging, and that we see that there's a, there's a way in which this clinging and craving is not considered positive, right? But again, you can imagine how this works if you're, only, if you're thinking about the high-end metaphysical framework. When we actually look at where ethical deliberation and struggling takes place in pre-modern Indian materials, in narrative texts, or if in Hindu India and say epic literature, you see these ideas, but there's no vision. There's no sense that this is the single framework. That, well, what we all ought to do is we all ought to be focusing on quieting our cravings and attaining this serenity. As we saw from the cosmological picture, that serenity is happening in the Brahma world in most cases. And that's just not our world, nor will it be our world in any kind of reasonable time frame. The fact that it's possible may provide an aspiration but that it is a goal in something that we're, that we're trying to attain in the here and now, maybe, but it's so remote relative to the other spectrum of felicity that we ought to care about. So I think that the vision, I think it's not quite a vision, um, if that makes sense. So then you ask, well, what's the alternative? And I think of it this way, um, and this is the bicycle story mm. that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Suppose you're trying to teach someone to ride a bicycle. First thing, what is the vision? Don't fall down. Balance. What's the vision? What's the specific, actionable vision of riding a bike? I would suggest that there isn't one. Point one. Point two, can you write down and tell me, I'm a smart guy, I spend a lot of time reading, we all do. Can you write down how to ride a bike so that I can follow the re recipe, instructions, and ride? Well, maybe I can play the piano. Is writing the notes and playing them correctly making music? Roberto plays the piano beautifully, so I bring that I'm example. But the, the example with the bike. Roberto plays the piano? No. I've never seen him. <laughs> I've known this brother for 40 no. years. He's he playing he plays on the piano. underground, he, on the down low. <laughs> the let's go back to the bicycle. So no vision, right? No vision. You can't write down statements. OK. Or you could write down some things that are true, but reading them doesn't help me ride a bike. There's something else. So the alternative is no vision, no set of statements, no code. Not that they're irrelevant, but they're not sufficient by any means. It's not even clear they're necessary. So the alternative is that ethics is viewed as teaching someone to ride a bicycle. And the problem with riding a bicycle is that we, those of you who know how to ride know how to ride. It's not clear that if you're both riding from here to Harvard Square, that you would both turn right exactly at the same time or left at the same time. There's a kind of context sensitivity to what you have to do to ride it well. Now, does that mean there's no way to ride a bike? And of course there is. Does it mean you can specify in advance exactly what you're supposed to do at any juncture? No. So I think that the conduct of life 
in pre-modern India. And the conduct of life through Buddhist and Hindu texts is about teaching someone to ride the good life or the, mm. or the ethical mm. bicycle. Mm. And that's what all these narratives are trying to do. And that's mm -hmm. what the structure of thinking about this is supposed to do. So then we ask the bigger question. OK, fine. Suppose you're right. How is it connected to what's also clearly present? These really incredibly sophisticated metaphysical discussions. And my view is we can connect them like Schopenhauer did. But they weren't connected. And they didn't see the need. The question I ask is, why do we see the need? That would be my answer. Mm. Yeah, let, me, let me push you on that, though, because uh, you have hit something that is so fundamentally important. And I want to accent the radicality of those four last claims that you made. If you look at the Western philosophical tradition, let's say from Plato through Susan Langer all the way up to William James, they believe that truth was a species of the good, which is to say, in the language of Josiah Royce, the beliefs about the nature of reality is part of your moral life, not just claims about nature. And therefore, any talk about phonesis, practical wisdom, no matter how microsocial, mm -hmm. no matter how tied to a particular example, there are what Heidegger called background conditions or what Charles Taylor would say, those basic assumptions mm -hmm. that are usually tacit, unarticulated, but still informing your conception of what you do in terms of pursue, pursuing phronesis, practical wisdom. Now, in the history of the West, it's primarily the positivistic and scientific philosophers. Of course, you know it. You're trained right there at Emerson Hall in the philosophy department. Uh, uh, they're the ones who say, like A.J. Ayer, Language, Truth, and Life, that the nature of reality has to do with prediction, domination, predicting future light of past. That's physics. And it has nothing to say about ethics, because ethics has no truth claims at all. It's just emotions. It's just passions. It's what people feel. And you can imagine, from Plato to James and Langer saying, no, no, in fact, when you look deeper, there's got to be something richer. Now, you say within the Indian philosophical tradition, what's richer has to do with narratives, has to do with epic stories and so forth that are shot through with metaphysical assumptions of some sort. Because they have to have a philosophical anthropology. They have to have a conception of who we are as human beings, a conception of human nature, a conception of what is the relation between persons and historical circumstances, whether they're, comp they're, they're capable of changing them and so forth. Now, if that's the case, does that mean that you would have to push back a little on the claims about the severance between ethics and epistemology or metaphysics and morality in some way? You, you, you see where I'm going with oh, that? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I see where you're going. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. So of course, the answer is no. I shouldn't have to push back. <laughs> but oh, I'll, that's good. I'll, that's good. I'll, I'll say no and say why, and then yes. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll make a better objection to it that supports your point. Mm, I so like that. I'll say no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say no because to me, that's like asking what the underlying physics of riding a bike has to do with riding a bike. There may be an underlying physics of riding a bike. I guess there is for riding a bike. And I guess there is. It's a little more complicated with living the conduct of life. It's not clear, at least to me, that there's as clear of a physics for it or even anthropology of it. And if the bike is the, is the standard example, is, is the clearest case, I'm not sure it's necessary anyways. That would be one point. Mm. That, what, that what's not necessary? That, that there is a physics to riding a bike is obviously necessary to riding a bike, uh -huh. if you take laws of nature seriously. Knowledge of those laws and knowledge of that physics seems irrelevant, even though tacitly balance or gravity seems to mm. be relevant. In a way, a kind of knowledge of it and awareness of it where awareness has a certain valence is irrelevant. Not even as a general approach? Even as a general approach. I mean, I don't know how many of you knew the physics of riding a bike before you rode or even since. But it seems to me it's not even useful as a general approach. It's a curiosity. Well, you start about five, five or six years old, you make that breakthrough. I don't understand. Well, I mean, you're not, Sorry. I don't understand. You're not going to have the laws. Oh, the bicycle which, example is this, that if. No, so, I under, no, oh. I understand what you said about it. I don't understand why it's true. You said oh, there's no true. vision of riding a bike, seems to me. There manifestly is a vision. The vision is that balance in riding a bicycle 
is achieved only dynamically and not statically. Okay. And so if you want to stay yeah. afloat on the bicycle, you have to be in movement. So look, and that's fine. I'm saying that if that, that, that level of vision is fine, it's just so vague in general that it's kind of useless for the day-to-day -day reality of teaching and riding a bike. That's the claim, especially with metaphysics. But let me give a better mm. example to mm. Cornell's point. The, the tr one troubling feature of my view, actually seemingly troubling feature of my view, is that almost all Indian texts, the texts start out with the claim that if you see things as they really are, Buddhism, right? Mm -hmm. Seeing things as they really are is the fast track to nirvana. Or you have to get things right mm -hmm. if you want to act in ways that'll get you the good things that you want, right? So there's this notion that being correct and having the right view of metaphysics and the right view of epistemology is in a way necessary for successful action. So, so in a sense, what your point is, right. that's absolutely there. Right. Right. But what's so interesting is that that discussion is totally disconnected, for the most part, from the narratives. So mm. even in the Indian case, this objection mm. is raised, mm. this worry is raised, or this, not even worry, this point is raised. Not only that, it's underlined. And yet, I still think they're separate. That's fair. But I think one way of trying to account for that would be that when you're making claims about laws of nature, you're really just talking about explanation. Mm -hmm. And explanation is a difference that makes no difference if you're concerned with moral execution, which is practical living, the conduct mm -hmm. of life. Explanation has its place and role, but an explanation of how a bike moves doesn't have an impact on whether you become artistic in regard to how you move that thing. Mm -hmm. So something else is at work. Now, in terms of conduct of life, we're talking about character. We're talking about desirable ways of being in the world. And an explanation of this table in terms of micro nature just doesn't help in terms of how you form your character. You can have folk who have magnificent character who believe in Ptolemy. And you say, no, the Earth is not really flat, and it's not at the center of things. But the most beautiful person I ever met in my life. Mm. They got pre-Copernican cosmologies. <laughs> but they're so magnificent. And then you got some of these Einsteinian folk walking around gangsters. <laughs> so they on top of the, they on the cutting edge in terms of explanation of micro nature. But in terms of moral execution and what it really means to be a noble human being, they're in the, I would say, you know, pre- Something, something age in that sense. So I, I, in that way, you can say, well, I do understand. There's different registers here. There's explanation. There's interpretation. That could be the philosophical, artistic, narrative, epic. It could be comic that we've talked about. And then you got phronesis, this practical wisdom. And in that sense, I would agree with the Indian brothers and sisters. Because they said this phronesis has a relative autonomy. Therefore, we're not going to write texts about this, the way in which we write about these others. That's what, what we, we yeah. very much agree. But what, 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 so, what, do you, what do you take of that read, though? Make sense? It makes sense. Okay. But let me, let, me, let me restate the, yeah. the, uh, a line of differentiation here among mm -hmm. views, because we have these two controversies going, one about the relation of morals to metaphysics and the other about the contest of moral views. So take these three conceptions of happiness that have both been represented in the world history of thought. So one is that happiness is a negation. It's the privation of suffering. And it is therefore, at its limit, a state of emptiness or non-existence. Now, it ha that view, that moral view, has a loose relation to a metaphysical conception. It's not a tight relation. It's not a one-to-one -one relation. But it is a relation of affinity. It has a relation to a view that says the world of apparent distinction and change is illusory, unreal or less real. And uh, 
we must not be taken in by it, because if we are taken in by it, we will be attached to these ephemeral or illusory things and will suffer more. Mm -hmm. So let's say that's one view. And that view is represented by certain forms of speculative monism in ancient India and in Western philosophy. Mm -hmm. Now, then there's a second view, which is happiness is not the privation of suffering, but happiness is fullness of activity and of being, in which we develop on many different fronts. And there is then the potential for contradiction or conflict among our connections and engagements. And we have to achieve some equilibrium through, through moderation of some kind. Avoiding extremes, for example, as in Aristotle's ethics. And many of the dominant positions in uh, Greek and Hellenistic philosophy and in modern thought take this view. Uh, and this view also has a loose relation to a metaphysical position. The, the view is the world has a structure. It is a permanent structure. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. permanent structure is governed by enduring regularities. And to achieve the requisite moderation in the fullness of our activities, we have to have a clear-sighted understanding of this permanent structure so we can be oriented in relation to it. Now comes a third view. And the third view uh, is paradoxical, but has acquired immense power in contemporary culture and has borne the influences of Christianity and Romanticism and our revolutionary ideas about morals and politics. So on this third view, happiness is the fullness of activity. But the fullness of activity is deepened and extended not by some kind of moderation, but by permanent contradiction and transformation. And there is a price to pay for our growth collectively and individually, which is the heightening of vulnerability. We suffer, but by suffering, we become greater. We increase our quota in this divine attribute of transcendence. That's very different from the Aristotelian view or from this worldly wisdom of the ancient philosophers. And it has immense <coughs> power in the world right now. And this view also has a loose relation to a metaphysical conception. And it says the world has no permanent structure. Everything that is real is ephemeral but no less real on that account. So therefore, also against the speculative monism. And everything changes, including change itself. And our progress in the world is related to the understanding of this true character of reality. So that's the summary of, a, of, of an attitude that I would state by opposition to your view. And from the standpoint of that approach, what would be interesting about ancient Indian religion and philosophy on the conventional interpretation of it is that it is the first position. And the first position is at the furthest removed from the third. So the third is ours or mine. And I need enemies. And I'm interested in those views that are at the furthest distance from my own. So, good. I think that, so. Many points, but two main ones. The first is that the connection between the metaphysical picture and the let's call it the ethical picture need not be, in Schopenhauer's sense, a kind rootedness, but there can be a kind of more looser connection. Mm -hmm. And Roberto mm -hmm. gave a very good one. You can imagine how, if you're a monist and a certain kind of constructivist, you could have a really strong anti-realist attitude about the things we want, about what there is. It's kind of all up to us. And so it takes away, it seems to undermine some of, the, some of the substance of what you might want and desire. Perfectly good, perfectly good. And it's, it's the case that in India, among Buddhists and non-Buddhists as well, those who adopt this kind of constructivist view can apply it to things in the world and occasionally do. So that's fair. What's interesting is even those who aren't monists or solipsists in this way 
are trying to affect the same thing. So they may be trying to affect a kind of less attachment focused view. So that's also right. They don't need the monism. They can use something else from, there, from over here to sort of undermine mm -hmm. this view. What's the point? The point is, it's not that the two have to be separate. It's not that the two are never relatable in ways that mutually support one another. It's that, that it's very rare, hard to find. And what that means is that, that ultimately, it's not this that's driving this or this that's the reason for this. There's something different that's driving this now. Mm. That's sort of one point. Second point is, this in no way complicates the picture you suggested. It could still be that we have a dominant view here, our current one, a middle view, and then an Indian view, and that that provides a good foil to this. I think it definitely does. I think what I, the way I tried to describe the polyimaginaire and some of the incendiary conclusions are in a way very incompatible and challenge large parts of this contemporary picture that we have. Um, but the situation over at this end is much richer because it's more complicated. And so I think that if we, if we need an enemy, we can get a much better one over here. And we can have an enemy who might even be able to change our minds. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in that sense, yes. So mm -hmm. the overall structure, I see, the reason for the structure, this being the enemy may be a little bit different. I also think okay. part of we, we're going to open it up a little bit. It strikes me part of the problem is, is this modern prejudice about being happy. You see, where did the notion come from that we're in the world to be happy? Good God Almighty. Uh, I mean, Kant says virtue is always over against happiness. Yeah. Second critique, critique of practical reason. We've talked about him as a lapsed Lutheran. Mm -hmm. Right? Lutherans are not in the world to be happy. <laughs> but then he promises in the third critique that they'll come together yeah. again. But in the realm of art and a certain kind of understanding of judgment. In the future. In the future, but that's a the projection. Afterlife. But he's already got the future in the second critique in terms of God, freedom, and immortality. But let's not go into close reads of Kant right now. But the point is this. <laughs> the point is this, that uh, uh, this notion of to be human, and we were talking about this in terms of the uh, prophetic legacy of Jerusalem and Hebrew scripture, right. has to do with hesed. See, hesed is not about happiness. See, steadfast love is not about happiness. And even when you go back to the pre-modern pagans, Aristotle talks about eudaimonia. Sappho, the highest form of being human is love, and love is what? Always already bittersweet. Always already bittersweet. So if you fall in love to be happy, go to Disney World. <laughs> he said, something else is going to happen. It's going to be joy and happiness. That's Frankie Beverly. That's maze. That's reality. Joy is qualitatively different than happiness. Joy does come out of the prophetic legacy of Jerusalem. Happiness doesn't. Joy does. Joy is working at a very different level here. I would say the same thing about Sophocles as a pre-modern pagan. He's not talking about happiness. Antiquity is not talking about happiness. It's talking about practical wisdom bending in order to be able to fortify oneself. Shakespeare is not about happiness. Te Chekhov's not happiness. You see what I mean? The blues is not about happiness. I'm feeling happy today. <laughs> Nobody loves me but my mom and she might be driving too. <laughs> hey. No, no. But there's a joy in wrestling with the world, which is, you know, fallen and wretched and all the other categories we see coming out of Jerusalem. But in that sense, is it the case in Indian philosophy that it shares this particular sense of being in the world is not really about being happiness, but how to be fortified because the world is so <laughs> impermanent, full of so much suffering, hunger, domination, oppression, and so on? Maybe, in a sense mm. that. Mm. The world is full of those things, but it's also full of beauty. That's true, too. That's it's true also too. full of joy. That's true, too. The Absolutely. world is over full with things that we want, that we need, but that we can't want and need at the same time, mm -hmm. or that we can't attain at the same time. So it's, not it's, it's full of all of it. I think that's, and you have to recognize that when you have all of it, it's bittersweet. It's like love in that sense. It's bittersweet. So 
how do, what do we foreground and what do we background? One way of reading Roberto's picture is what one foregrounds, because it may be so primary, is this sense of attachment to things. Now, does that mean you're supposed to be disinterested in your child or your partner? No. It just, it's a kind of education of desire or an education of attachment. And one way to educate is to learn how to attenuate it in some way. So that, in a way, I think could be consistent with one of the points you're making um, about this. So I, I think that, I don't know if that answered the question. I may have lost it. But no, no, no. It's, it's Shall we open it up? Shall we open it up? Uh, Questions, queries. Yes, run, jump right in. We get rid of all the spooky stuff. Right, right. But I, I think in, in that streamlined version, the, 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 the way the path to the practice through practical wisdom is about meditation. That if, if living a life is right and right, then meditation is like stimulus, right? Where you train yourself in a controlled environment to break the chain of causation, so that when you're out there on the street, something happens, you can uh, be less in your reaction to it. And I guess. Necessarily so much of what my question is, but I wonder if if the if that concept of a of meditation as a path towards practical wisdom has something to do with the separation between metaphysics and ethics. If we don't, if if if, if the path to metaphysics is the onus is put on the meditator to arrive at their position on mm -hmm. ethics through this. <coughs> So what we would need to figure this out is we would need some good accounts of where meditation as a form of practice and where success in meditation leads to success in conducting one's life in a better way, right? And where it leads to success and where it doesn't, to what extent it is helpful and to what extent it isn't. You don't see a lot of that, at least in the narrative literature and certainly in systematic literature. There's a whole genre of path literature that begins to talk about some of these issues. The path literature is for scholastic, it's for monks who are engaging in meditation. You know, meditation is not 20 minutes a day, you know, mindfulness or something. The kind of meditative practices they're engaging are very different. And so we would, have, we would have to do a lot of looking. First, at when they consider successful meditators, what connection do they say there is or isn't with respect to the conduct of life? My feeling is there's not very much. And then we'd have to say, okay, if we're looking at our streamlined modern Buddhism, could we even claim that kind of benefit? Um, it's hard to imagine that it has no relevance, right? The question is, how, how, what's, how is it relevant? Is it like spin class? Is it like, I don't know, lifting that helps you just get stronger at riding a bike? Is it, I don't know, like paving the roads so they're smoother and easier to ride? I don't know. But it's a good question. And these are all really open questions still. I mean, I've presented things as though it's clear, but I mean, Almost no one agrees with me. I should let you know. So <laughs> you should feel free to disagree. <laughs> you still got to hear the Well, but, but just on this point, yeah. this, is, this is not just a technical point about meditation because it's a micro form of the general dispute. So uh, one view of meditation is you empty out consciousness. So you don't meditate about X. You meditate about nothing. Now, one would say, one might take the opposite view, that that, that that practice is based on a misunderstanding of the nature of the human mind. We, uh, the, the, we, we are most human and most free in our imaginative capacity. And the two crucial moves of imagination are distancing from the phenomenon. The image is the memory of a perception and then transformative variation. So the mind comes to life not by being emptied out on this view, but by being f filled up and by subsuming the present reality before it under a larger range of possibility. And that's the opposite. 
And so, and, and those two views of the mind are, as it were, proxies for two more general moral strategies. So one strategy says, the world is full of suffering and illusion. We retreat to a citadel, to a fortress. And in this fortress, uh, we become immune to the slings and arrows of fortune, and able from a distance to be benevolent to others. The opposite view says, that's a spiritual perversion. That's a fundamental misunderstanding of how we progress. Because we come into the possession of life only through engagement and connection. Uh, and these people are recommending to us that we deal with our fear of death by dying beforehand. And this is the opposite of what we want. So this is a real contest. And, 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 and it's a contest in which the macro problem of the view of being or happiness, happiness I'm taking as just being, right. is, is represented even at the micro level in this contest about meditation. So my resistance to some of the tenor of Paramount's argument is that I don't want the great lines of this dialectic, of this contrast of options, to disappear in a kind of moral nominalism in which all we have is a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Uh, because it's vital for us to understand that we have great options before us. And that the great moral options are connected with the contest of visions of the nature of ultimate reality. But I think you have to um, respond, though, to what would be the limits of your own very rich and fecund romantic prejudice. That is to say, if you valorize transformation, conflict, change, you, you also are going to reach the limits of that particular orientation sure. in which, like the of end of, uh, like Beethoven at the very end, of it's course. silence. So of course. The music will have transformation. Of the course. The music will have, of but course. there's going to be moments of, of surrender and of silence, course. and you so, then have so, to deal with your own impotence. Uh, so to take one example. So, I mean, impotence so, in the, so, in the so, general so, sense. So, um, <laughs> 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 so, so to take we one example. We understood that. That's right, that's right, that's right. So to take, so to take one example, uh, r romanticism has a series of illusions. Yes, that's so right. So there's the that's good right. part and the bad part. That's right. The bad part is the war against structure, against routine and repetition. Kierkegaard said the war against repetition is a war against life. Life is full of repetition. So it's the romantic idea that we become fully human only by shaking the structures in those interludes in which we go beyond the structures. Mm -hmm. uh, romantic love against the routines of married life, the mob in the streets against the bureaucratic apparatus. But we can never change the relation of spirit to structure. That's a limitation, That's a limitation. of romanticism. That's right. So, That's right. so we, we attempt to deepen the transformative view in a realist direction, expunging from it this and other romantic illusions. That's what I'm taking as a paradigm of, of progress in our moral insight. And in the course of that attempt, we then confront views that are in fundamental contradiction to this one. Mm -hmm. So it's not just expunging the illusions of the romantic view. It's taking a view which is radically different from it. So and, and, and my fear is that if we deflate these large options and take them down to this level of just a collection of particular experiences and recipes, mm -hmm. we are denying itself gotcha. this sense that we have the large so options. I actually, th that would be, the ap so the whole reason I've in I'm intervening as I, as I am is because I want the options to be, in a way, even more stark and more sharp. I just want them to have what I will call the right differences and the right degrees of contrast. I think the contrast might be more radical than what Roberto suggests and what Roberto wants. Let's take the meditation example that you kind of gave. 
that's not at all the picture of pre-modern India about how meditation and asceticism is understood and viewed. It's one tiny thread. Why do people in narratives go off and meditate? What happens when they go off to everybody else? When do they do it for everybody else? When does the power that they achieve over here, is that primarily for a transformative purpose? And when does it escape? You have the whole range. But if we can learn how to capture that dynamism, I think we'll have a stronger contrast and therefore recover real possibilities for over here. Where I struggle mightily is in coming up with the one sentence or two sentence phrase sort of thought that captures that in its complexity. That's where I'm failing. So what it looks like might be that it's a watering down. But actually, what I'm trying to do is concentrate it. What I'm unable to do is tell you what the taste of that concentrate is. So all I can do is describe the reason why I think it needs to be concentrated down and how we may go about it. What I still need to figure out is what happens if you taste it. And how can I articulate it in a way that's different from this taste over here? Roberto points to some very real things, I think. This issue of the one you talk about with craving, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we can do better, is what I'm trying to say. We may not need it, because all we need, I think, for Roberto's argument is that there's a contrast. And that contrast teaches us alternative possibilities. How fine grain we need to get, how much of a connoisseur of the difference of taste we need for the argument to work. I think is not so clear. But I'm interested in this connoisseurship of this difference of taste because I'm convinced that if I can figure it out, I can I actually can give you more for the contrast of the claim. I actually don't want less. I want I think there's more. We've got two questions here. Yeah, go ahead. Is it then because you understand the authentic narrative not needing to prescribe No, no, so, so two things. First, we're not talking about, so we're, we're, I wasn't talking about Vedic narratives. I was talking about sort of specifically Buddhist narratives and then more general uh, Sanskrit narratives, right? So we, you might call those Hindu narratives. It could be Jain or Buddhist, just a minor thing. The point is precisely that living life is not enough. Nature always needs culture. Nature always needs learning. And that's why all these narratives exist, in the sense that they exist, and thinking about society and thinking about politics exists, because we have to intervene. We have to find ways of intervening in the ordinary course of life. The ordinary course of life is one in which there is suffering, in which there is death, in which there is beauty. Right? It's not that it's OK the way it is. Right? It's that there's a, there's, a, there's a need for all of this. You, know, you take, mm. take the Kama Sutra, for example. There's always sex. It's there. But this is kind of like a connoisseur manual or a description manual. It's that really nature, the biological act of sex, needs culture. And you can apply this generally to all aspects of living. They need culture. So they need these texts and these narrative and the scholastic reflection. They just may not need metaphysical sex. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Here in the city, Mali. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, is that the religion one? Yeah. Okay.
book major about uh, ethics in the non-Western past that lets uh, Westerners overestimate what they have to contribute? Sure. Good. Let's take that. So when I'm talking, when I say there's no ethics, what am I saying? I'm saying there's no philosophical ethics. That means there's no, the, t the, the kinds of books that were written about theories of knowledge or what there is are not written about ethics. I'm, I should also be very, very clear. There is ethical thinking. There's just no philosophical ethics. What is ethical thinking? One place you point to is in the Pali Suttas, there's the idea of shila. Seems like it's morality, right? So let's ask, what kind of work can the concept of shila do? And is that the central place where Buddhists think about how to conduct our life? First of all, the Pali Suttas and the Pali material is for the most part for monastics. Also in the Pali Suttas is a whole idea of a spectrum of felicities. So I'm all for a spectrum of felicities, and Sheila may be on there somewhere. So that's not incompatible with the picture at all. It just says that what you're going to get out of looking at Sheila for how to conduct your life is going to be pretty minimal. It'll be insufficient <coughs> for conducting your life in a rich enough way. And the guiding principles that you think you get that are specified right, are going to be insufficient in any context. The question that we should ask is what Roberto's asking is, let's take those guiding principles and see if they're in contrast to other guiding principles. My view is that those guiding principles are often so general that we don't know if they're in contrast or not because they're kind of bland. They get real context and real texture in, for example, in Buddhist context, in Vinaya rules, and in the narratives that are used around them. So then we get the Queen or Damian Kion thing, which is that, look, Buddhist ethic, we agree there wasn't Buddhist ethics as we want it to be, so we're going to make it up. I don't have a problem with that at all. I mean, we are supposed to learn from pasts, and if we can use Buddhist narratives or misuse Buddhist narratives <laughs> for the good, <laughs> OK. What I don't want is I don't want someone to say that what's going on over here with Buddhist ethics is what was going on in the past. What I would rather have them say, by the way, is, yeah, I don't want to go have business as usual just with Buddhist words. I want to really figure out if they were here today, what might they say? How might they go about taking this, this uh, I'll use whatever word, vision or approach or attitude toward ethics and engage with the work that you've been doing in this class, if that makes sense. So I, but mm -hmm. I understand the concern. Mm -hmm. Those be my name. Uh oh, maybe it was a bad choice. course, we, we all strive and seek so many things, right? There's a framework, I don't know if you, maybe it's in the source book, but probably not in the Buddhism section. They're often called the, I call them the spheres of human activity. It's sort of dharma, kind of social and political order, artha, um, sort of stuff you want, profit, personal success, kama, passion, right? Moksha, some kind of release. These might be the, these might identify things that you strive after. And so that's part of the spectrum of felicity. Some of the things on the felicity you could categorize in these ways. So of course, wishing to ride a bike is going to lead to certain kinds of actions. We can ask the question of what should we wish for? What should we want? What should we crave? Or is there a way of wishing and wanting that isn't craving? All of that comes into play. How do we learn that is the question. Do we learn it from someone telling us? Yes, that's helpful. Is that sufficient? Usually not. So what we have in the Indian material about these four spheres of human activity is a set of documents and texts, Kama Sutra is one, let's say, that gives a more prescriptive way of looking at it, which is also much more complex than most people think. And then we have these narratives, which give us a kind of really rich, con context-specific way of dealing with it. So yeah, it would, it would be weird, wouldn't it, if you have a whole culture that doesn't deal with the kinds of things we actually strive after and ought to strive after. And I would also think, though, just in terms of my own uh, experience of teaching my kids how to ride a bike, that there's something intangible called self-confidence. Mm -hmm. 
that you're not going to get in that book. You see, you got to take your little precious one and say, look, you are a bike rider. <laughs> yes, you are. No, daddy, I can't. Yes, you are, girl. Yes, you are, girl. Self-trust, self-affirmation. Isn't that the real basic precondition of even getting in a, getting on a bike? You see? And now that, to me, is a kind of existential dimension that is so crucial for the moral life, too. It, 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 and there is, there's got to the be a The two things go together, the vision and, and the acceptance of the risk. So Paramal said, the vision was empty. It's not empty. To ride a bicycle, the most important thing you have to understand is that you can't be balanced by simply getting on top of the bike and not pedaling. You have to pedal in order to remain in balance. That isn't empty. That's the, that's the most important prescription. But in order to act on that, then, you have to be willing to risk falling down. And so it's this dialectic between the vision and the risk, which is how we think of, of a large part of our moral progress. So I, didn't, I don't want to say the vision is empty. I want to say it's kind of banal. So what that means is, yeah, when you sit on a bike, you have to have the vision that you not fall over. No, you have to understand that you can only keep on <laughs> I know, it. I know, I know. You keep can on. only keep on it by pedaling. Yeah, and then you come to understand that you keep on it by pedaling. I don't see what the vision is. Well, you gave a simple mechanical example. You the gave... vision is proportionate to the example. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so then what we need is, this is fine. Listen, listen we've done really well here, because then what we need is, we, if, if that's the, if the, so what Roberto has conceded is that the vision is proportionate to the example, and the example is kind of weak. The vision is kind of weak. So we want now the good vision that's supposed to work for ethics that he thinks there is, and we can see if it actually works or not. I, I claim this is no vision at all, especially for my a kid who's riding a bike. You know, I think it's a wonderful you know, example. But, but what I think it's a wonderful right. example. <laughs> I really do, but I still think it's I, both vision, it's self-confidence. It's, it it's is self self and not only that, you don't just pedal though, Roberto. You got to pedal with rhythm. Because <laughs> if you're pedaling and you don't have the rhythm, you're going to fall anyway. So there's all these elements that go into riding that darn bike. And, and, and there's a whole host of aspects that we. I, I mean, you remember Hillary Putnam, our dear brother, who we love so much, yeah. that he used to talk about learning how to ski. You can't learn how to ski by reading a book on how to ski. You got to get up there. You got to believe that you're able to ride the snow and so forth and so on. You see? And that is learning how. Knowing that is not the same as knowing how. Correct. Knowing how is phonesis. Knowing that is propositional. And there's roles for propositional knowledge. Absolutely. There's roles for non-propositional knowledge. And maybe the but learning how to live is more like learning how to ride that bike and learning how to ski. It's just that when you're riding the bike in the snowstorm, when people have told you for thousands of years, you don't have the capacity to ride a bike. See, that's the history of patriarchy. That's the history of white supremacy. That's the history of othering people. You were almost born not to be a bike rider. But as soon as you learn, as soon as you learn how to ride a bike, you notice you're in first place all the time. <laughs> Somebody been lying to me. Somebody been lying to me all these centuries. They've been lying to me. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> you see what I mean? I totally see. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good example, though, man. I'm telling you, you got a lot of rich formulations in that thing. <laughs> but the question, question. What's some sisters? Some sisters? Some sisters? No, I, I, have you, you? You haven't had a chance. You, you've had a chance to ask questions in the class so far. We're gonna come right next to you. Is that all right? So the time period we're talking about, right? Let's say the early Buddhism, let's say. You can, 
we know actually very, very little about the sociopolitical realities. All the evidence that we have is from texts that were produced by an elite group of learned people. It's their picture of the past, their way of dealing with it we primarily have, and then their opponents. So what was sociopolitically real is really hard to say. We have a sociopolitical imaginaire. But you're right. Most people couldn't read and write. Most people did not study classical Sanskrit metaphysics at any point, just like most people today don't study metaphysics and ontology <laughs> in any way. So the question was, how does that fact, or those facts, relate to this I think he used the word separation. I don't think there was a separation. I think there was a never a together. So it's not that there was a together and oh, for some reason it was separated. The question is, why put them together? Now, as we've already talked about, it's not that, I mean, I was a bit dramatic in talking about them being radically disconnected, right? We've already seen that even in the scholastic text, there's a story told about why you need to know the way things are to get things. We've also seen how, in, when Roberto described how a monistic constructivist picture may contribute to a weakening of craving. The connections, though, are very, very loose, is my point. So I guess the answer is, I don't know enough about the sociopolitical reality. And even if I did, I don't think we would have to explain the explanation I mean, the separation, we'd have to, we would have to ask how the sociopolitical reality, what was different about it that didn't require them to come together. And that, I think, is a meaningful and deep question, and one that I think would get to the kind of contrast that Roberto already has a picture of that we might be able to deepen mm -hmm. and make more productive. But, but we can float out a hypothesis and say that elites at the top will engage in a variety of ideological appropriations of nirvana, of dharma, all of these different concepts. This is true of any religious uh, way of life, to ideologically appropriate in such a way that it rationalizes the hierarchy. Yeah, sure. So we were speaking about this before Cornell, and, and there's this idea that the, the promoted by people like Dumézil, that the Indo-European peoples had a basic structure in, in, in which there, there are three main castes or social ranks, the priests or thinkers, then the fighters and rulers, then the working people. And they are related to a hierarchy of three faculties in the soul, on top reason, understanding, then the action-oriented impulses, and then the sensual appetites. And the correct understanding of the world makes it possible to reaffirm order both in society and in the soul, and order in society and in the soul reinforce each other. So that was the, the historical context in which these views arise. Now, what's interesting is that although the views arise in that context, and they're the creation of the top caste, of the top rank, associated with this double hierarchy of society and of the soul, they have the potential to develop in a way that defies and subverts the hierarchy. So for example, in the idea characteristic of this vision of the world, that all the divisions within humanity are shallow and don't go down to the bottom. And then there's an ambiguity in these religions. Are they offering simply a redescription of the world? Or are they? offering an invitation to change the world. So are they saying that the, the, the slave owner and the slave are fundamentally the same? Are they saying that the institution of slavery is incompatible with our spiritual estate? That's the, that's the dynamic. And it, it seems to me that, that, and this comes back to my persistent worry with the character of your account, that we don't want our interpretation of these views to be so fragmentary and deflationary that they lose this subversive potential, which is what makes them useful and important to humanity. So let me take just that. I, I completely agree. And again, I think that I am act, I, that this, that this that sort of getting the picture right, I'll say, can actually help the project. 
and isn't watering it down, but it's concentrating. Let me give you an example of this social hierarchy. There's a very famous or infamous work called The Laws of Manu, called the Manava Dharma Shastra, which is basically how most people learn about what they think pre-modern India was like. The most powerful lesson that one should take from Manu is if you actually read the thing carefully and think about it, is that Manu, there is no Manu, by the way, but the, auth the, the, the text Manu proves that its vision for the social world fails. It proves that its picture of hierarchy fails. And in doing that, it provides us with transformative alternatives. So now to do that, what do you have to do? It's hard work. It's not a simple statement. It might, you see, it might seem initially that, you're, you're, that it's getting more complex and watering it down. But I think the ultimate conclusion is that when we can show that Manu shows that Manu, why Manu fails, you have a real recognition of what alternatives look like and why that's the right and actually dharmic alternative from the world of Manu, mm -hmm. despite what might be on the surface. So, so that I think kind the, of the, the challenge there, though, what, what, is, what does fail really mean? Because you can have failure. Yeah. I mean, look, look at the history of, of this country. Democracy fails in relation to these people over here. But they don't really count anyway. See, that's the ad hoc rationalization. Or the same would be true you know, in caste in India, mm -hmm. for example. You need the hierarchies in place. These folks don't really count, really. And even though it's millions of them, and therefore you got an ad hoc uh, rationalization for we know the world is full of suffering and domination and so <laughs> forth. Everybody's struggling. Everybody's in strife and what have you. And so the question then becomes, how do we really deal with the conception of failure that's operating? Because I think what Roberto's always looking for is how do we use failure as a way, as a launching pad for transformative da, 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 da. But sometimes, you know, that failure becomes, this is just the best we can do. Yeah. You lucky we've gone this far with it. You see, and there you get a deeply traditionalist understanding of tradition rather than a more subversive understanding of tradition. But my dear sister's been very uh, patient. I think that in the world of these, in the world of pre-modern Buddhism, I don't think we should think everyone was interested in pursuing nirvana, because realistically it takes eons and eons to attain. So in a way, even if it's a kind of goal, it's a goal like the life in the other worlds that we know is just, we're not going to get there. But knowing that it's there provides some kind of perspective on where we are mm -hmm. and gives it a certain kind of meaning. So in a practical sense, it's not as though everyone was a full-time enlightenment seeker in the sense that, oh, I think by doing this I can get it. They had, like most of us, more local concerns. When those, lo when those local concerns were understood specifically Buddhist, in a Buddhist way, for example, being punctuated by this nirvana mark, they may have taken on a certain valence. But I, I don't think that most of these texts are about attaining nirvana. They're about, about I think, really trying to, try to light, learn how to ride this bicycle. So what is the common thread, you asked? I don't know, at this point, I don't know if there's anything more specific than that. Trying to be good at conducting our life. What does that mean? What does it look like? It's very context specific. Does it mean anything goes? Absolutely not. Mm. What doesn't go? It's hard to list in a way that's specific. What are some of the tendencies we ought to have? I think Robert just picked on one. If you're a Buddhist, clearly this idea of clinging to things is not something that's positive, craving, 
Mm -hmm. I don't know many, I mean, that's true in generally in the pan-Indic world, regardless of your ultimate metaphysics. But like can you, you can crave not to crave, though, right? You can crave not to crave, that's craving. So how do you avoid that? Yeah, that's tough, too. <laughs> <laughs> craving not to crave is still craving. not to crave, yeah. No, you know, I'm obsessed with it. Yes, it does. Uh, no, and nor does Buddhism say that's the answer. Buddhism isn't about, oh, by the way, everybody, pack up, you know, join the monastery, join the monastic community. That's not, that's not how monasticism functions, right? It's, it's, it's clear that for some, right, that it is a value to have a monastic community. It's critical. Mm -hmm. And it's critical that those who are in a monastic community conduct themselves in certain ways, in ways that are distinct, often, from the way in which people who aren't in the monastic community function. But by no means is the idea that being a monastic is a solution uh, to some conduct of life issue, right? The, quite, the point I was raising is that when we look at why people, or, or how monasticism is represented, say, when mm. people mm. who are mm. in a story choose to go to the mountains, is it an escapism? Or is it a step to the side in order to gain the skills you need to re-engage? Or more importantly, when is it which? We have a full range of things. What we need to do is think about that range and ask when we take it all together what we're supposed to learn. I'm afraid there's just not going to be a simple answer. But there may be an articulatable vision, mm -hmm. even though it wasn't articulated, that we can provide. But the example, Parimal, the example is about the sacrifice of this structure of intimate or proximate reciprocities, which to something else. Mm -hmm. So you, you leave your wife and your child. That is extreme moral violence yes. on, the, on the account of the moral ideas <coughs> that were dominant before. Mm -hmm. So that's a revolution in, yes. in spiritual ideas. And it's not simply the continuation of the normal moral wisdom. No, the, that's absolutely right. I mean, if you imagine a culture where, I mean, forget the history aside, imagine a culture where there's no monastic communities and imagine a community where there is monastic communities. It's a huge difference. Absolutely right. And in fact, in, in pre-modern India around this time, we see that difference developing. There are plenty of alternative pictures to the, what was dominant then, right? These kind of monastic communities or non-Vedic communities, those were incredibly important. It was an alternative. What was the alternative to? Was it a resistance of a social order? Was it resistance of an intellectual culture? Was it resistance to a moral vision? What was it a resistance to? We're trying, we should figure out what that is. And that's not at least clear to me. Some of it is a, and a resistance on the part of whom? on the resistance on the part of elites, some who didn't want to participate in Vedic culture but wanted to create an alternative. It's not as though the people who were alternative Vedic culture weren't elites, right? So we, these kind of socio-political things that we might need to get some purchase, we don't always have. So what we have to do is think of the representations. And in the representations, we do get some of this. There's this picture that the Vedic people were elites and those who weren't were somehow non-elite. But what non-elite just means is not Vedic. It doesn't mean not elite means not Vedic. Mm. They, were, they, were, mm. they still were mm. able to travel and teach. You need money, you need funds, you need learning, all kinds of things. So um, mm. Mm. It, absolutely it's an alternative. I'm just trying to put my finger on exactly what the alternative is. And I'm not mm. willing to go quickly to the same kind of answer everywhere, either moral vision or ethics or metaphysics or something. I'm just not yeah. sure what it is. So oh, that's true. I wish I knew. That's true. And in some cases, the wife would be glad for him to leave. Yeah. I mean, he, because he's got a monk, monkish sensibility, 
<laughs> it's not the ideal companion, you see, you know what I mean? But, it, but we know how vicious the patriarchy was then and now. Go right ahead. You're going to so, take this yeah. one? <laughs> so, pardon, uh, just to put it in a setting, yeah. in the construction of a course. So the main topic of this course is a topic which we have not yet entered, which is the struggle between two secular ethics in the contemporary world, an ethic of self-construction and non-conformity, and an ethic of connection. But we are preceding that exploration by a discussion of two views represented by Buddhism and Schopenhauer on the one hand and Christianity on the other, in which our relation to one another is bound up with our relation to the source of ult ultimate value and reality. And that's, the, that's the, the way in which this discussion is framed in the movement of the course, mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. just so you understand. So this question then uh, raises the issue, it's the premise of this organization. So it's this, it's this idea that to have the right relation to one another, we have to have the right relation to the, to the infinite, represented as God or represented as ultimate reality. And that the two are connected somehow. And we can't relate to one another in the right way unless we relate to the infinite, to the, to the source of the absolute value and reality in the right way. Uh, so your polemic about metaphysics and morals uh, it appears to be a direct attack <laughs> on, that, on that idea. Uh, and is, 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 is representing those traditions in a way that disconnects what, at the outset, we wanted to connect. I would say it's... And we appreciate that. Well, of course. <laughs> we deeply appreciate it. I mean, I like to think of myself as a friendly guy, so no, no, I would we, like to say that... We want to be I Socratic. Actually, we can be Socratic all the way down. I am, <laughs> I am totally sympathetic and on board with the project. The project is how are they... that. That, well, to some degree, that the, that the that this that, that how we how we how we relate to each other this way, it's kind of horizontal. It's horizontal is somehow related to the vertical, right? Okay, I'm saying no, that's not it. But what's important is how we relate to each other, and that the vertical is there. But it's just not as tightly connected. So what we ought to do is if we really want to learn about the contrast is focus on our relation to each other in the right way, which I think will get you everything you hope to get by this contrast, but it'll be better. That's sort of the overall picture. So yes, I'm questioning the premise of this kind of a connection. But I don't, I mean, I So take this it. is the characteristic position of the modern humanistic philosophers. Which? Like, like our friends, someone like, say, Richard Rorty. Okay. Solidarity doesn't need metaphysics. But, I, this yeah. is, but this is not the view of a Christian. And this and, is not the view of pre-modern Indians yeah. either. Rorty yeah. is not the view. Final vocabulary is not the view. We know that for sure. That's true. What the positive alternative is, is tougher to get a, get a sense of. The infinite question, the question that you asked, and, and why I see why it's so pressing, is that, as we know, there's a lot of path literature among Buddhists about what it takes to attain nirvana. There's not a lot of, dis and there's some discussion about what it's like to be in nirvana. Some say it's blissful, some say it's not. There's a whole range of possibilities. What we don't have is once you're in nirvana, how does that alter the way you relate to anyone? That we don't have. So the question of how one gets nirvana and what it's like in nirvana and what emptiness is like, 
It's a lot of description of that, but it's, it's all different. They, they fight with each other a lot. One group says it's like, has bliss. Another group says, no, it doesn't. And then they fight about it. But how it connects, how being in a nirvanic state, one or the other, connects to what I call the horizontal, we don't have much of, relatively speaking, huh? some. So maybe it's not a radical, dis maybe there's like thin, wispy connections. But that isn't where the action is. The action should be over mm. here. But what, what makes you say, though, that the primacy of the horizontal relations vis-a-vis uh, -vis the vertical in the end uh, makes things better? What, what kind of evidence and argument? Oh, oh sorry, Kim, what do you mean? When, when you talked about the horizontal and the, and the vertical, yeah. and the vertical is loosely connected rather than tightly, and I agree with that. But then I heard you say something about it makes it better. Oh, no, I didn't mean to say that. You didn't say better? I, I hope not. Oh, OK. Yeah. Wh which word did you have in mind? Because I use the word, well, I don't know. I just think that we have oh, these two oh, things. Oh, okay. We have these two things. No, well, then I miss, I miss And in pre-modern India, yeah. they're not really connected, at least not in the way we want or need. But that that isn't, I think that would, should support Roberto's project even more. Because it means that the contrast is even greater. And the contrast can be located with what we really care. Or we have two contrasts now, three contrasts. We have a contrast between connection, no connection. We have a contrast between the vision here and whatever's going on here. And then we have the contrast between the way this is pursued, the, the kinds of things that go on over here, and the kinds of things that go on over here. So I think the lack of connection is precisely why the contrast is so powerful and important. Mm -hmm. That'll be my story, as a friend to the project. Questions, yes. Because in my picture, epistemology is over here. So it isn't talking about this over here. For example, in these texts, there's no discussion of epistemology, a, a, as it's discussed over here at all. I guess what I was trying to get at was this conception of prominence and notice and knowing. Yeah. And I don't know if this is significantly different from the way that epistemological traditions have developed uh, in Western thought or in other forms of thought. But I'm wondering relationship between the kinds of attitudes or social structures or insights that could generate uh, the conception of the prominence where there are different ways of knowing that are not analogous with one another mm -hmm. and the kinds of and how in retrospect looking back at that we might not be able to understand why these Oh, I see. Let me see if I can restate the question. So almost all classical Indian philosophers think about epistemology in terms of a sources of knowledge framework. They each have a different set of instruments that provide knowledge when they function properly. Perception is one. Reasoning is one. Some people think analogy is one, right? So those are the sources of knowledge. Everyone fights about how many there are and how they work and what they get you, right? So you're, I think the question is, is that commitment to thinking in a source of knowledge framework somehow account for or make it difficult to connect. Is that it? Yes. Um, I think no. I, I don't see any relation between the two. Because the source of knowledge framework is sufficiently diverse that I can definitely find something here to connect. I could connect them up in probably 10 minutes. They just don't do it. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Cravings are cravings are cravings. What their cravings are about doesn't change the fact that it's a craving. The question is, what kind of proper orientation ought we to have toward the, toward say some kind of practice if you're interested in getting nirvana? There's a lot of discussion about that too. So yeah, it would be craving. So what's the difference between craving and commitment? What's the difference between harmful desire and maybe a non-harmful desire, like love? What is, what do we do with something like intolerance that are wrong? Is that anger? Is that, what is that? How do we understand sort of the, I don't use this word, kind of the normativity of emotional responses and affect? How do we understand that in this framework? 
Where do we learn and get judgment about that kind of stuff? Again, I, it's, I mm. think these narratives and the back and forth between the narratives and more prescriptive texts and the struggle mm. is where we get it. There's no simple answer, is my thesis. And, and how do we go about defining what a desirable as opposed to the undesirable craving, or is a desirable craving an oxymoron? You know, I, mean, I was think, thinking about this in terms of the debate last night. And I thought about Jesus in the temple running the money changers out, you know. <laughs> and you say, now, is that a craving for justice or whatever it is? What's going on, Jesus? Should you have ceased that kind of craving? Should you have just walked by the temple and waved? So then you don't have to deal with Pontius Pilate later on? Or was something inside of you a craving for transformation, a craving for concern about the poor who had been exploited in this part? this particular part of the temple and so forth, that leads toward a critique of Roman Empire. So the, the question becomes, how do we, your point about commitment, conviction versus craving, and is there a way of diluting the kind of prophetic witness that we get mm -hmm. out of this particular Palestinian Jew? And is that, or is, or is, is the, is the, is the, can a critique be actually made in which you know, Jesus is overdoing it? Yeah, it's just overdoing it. Settle down. Cool off. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's, yeah. I mean, this is a, this sort of the moral psychology and the cognitive emotions, the normativity of affect in the pre-modern Indian world is, is, a, is a topic that I think is desperately needed to be able to think about. We, right. No one has really done a really good job with it yet. Yeah. So, but th these last two questions ra raise another issue that goes back to our central theme during this, this, this conversation. Uh, in, in, in Christianity, the fundamental horizontal relation, as you would describe it, is, this, is, is love, mm -hmm. the possibility of love, the denial of love. Love is not altruism, mm -hmm. and it requires knowledge. Its enemy is projection of fantasy onto the other. Mm -hmm. and the highest reality is conceived of in the category of personality, or by analogy, by analogical extension from the relations among people. So the transactions between God and humanity are represented by analogy to the relations among, among human persons. Uh, now, that seems to be fundamentally different from a view in which ultimate reality, the vertical, is conceived in the category of the impersonal, not in the category of personality. And the standard of our relations to one another is a standard of, of altruism, not of love. And altruism requiring no intimate knowledge of the other, involving generosity, sacrifice, mm -hmm. but not inner jeopardy. Mm -hmm. Is this not a fundamental contrast of views I, of great interest to humanity? I think it's a fundamental contrast of views of great interest to humanity. I think it captures a part of the horizontal from pre-modern India and the contrast with the horizontal from, mm -hmm. the Christian, mm -hmm. from the Christian world. I think that the vertical part is irrelevant. What you're saying about this Seems right. I mean, look, the, the, for example, over here, we have, what was the word you used? Um, love. Love. Um, here, you don't see love. That isn't as important. Is it altruism? I don't know. Is it generosity? OK, there's a certain, a certain kind of generosity, a certain notion of generosity. They're fundamentally different. What drives these worlds are very, very different. But there's love here. There's forgiveness here. There's hope here, let's say. There's not love here in anything like the same way. It's not clear to me there's forgiveness mm -hmm. in anything like the same way. Hope is closer. But as we think about the kinds of words we would use to describe and capture what's foregrounded in these two horizontal, they'll be radically different. My only complaint or concern is that is how those differences are accounted for or account for this vertical one. I'll give you one example. In devotional traditions, there's clearly where you have a personal God, 
where you have a really deep affective relationship with that God, devotional. That's the overarch, that's the under, that's the fundamental relation here, one of devotion. That doesn't translate here. I just don't, I just don't think that what you get here, even when there is a here, in the Indian traditions where there is a being or something, if you don't have anything, then it's one thing. But I just don't think they translate. This doesn't happen. Yes, the, 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 the theologians and believers in the Semitic monotheisms would reject that view. Yes. And they, they would affirm that there is an intimate connection yes. between the primacy of love over altruism and the primacy of the personal over the yes. impersonal. And so that's why I think they're wrong. I, well, I think they're wrong. And second, I think that's exactly why the contrast is greater than it appears if we allow for the horizontal vertical structure to be maintained in both. I think it's a more radical difference. A, a real difference, and one that we need to keep and we need to learn from. So I totally agree with that. My only B Let's give it up for our brother. <laughs> Let's give it up for our dear brother. I talked too much. I <laughs> know that was superb, man. That was superb, man. You guys that was superb, man. Thank you. No, thank you. I keep saying, no, I don't know. Yes, you did. We should continue our conversation. Yes, you I want to read the book. I think we could have a better conversation after you read the book. I think we do. I think we could. I, think, I actually think that my view is, can help the pro help. The